So let's see that expected return and risk reduction play out in practice. Let's see how we can think about forming an intelligent portfolio such that our portfolio return is not reduced as much as our portfolio risk. If we can do that, we found the golden goose. Okay. So here's the, we've got, uh, we're back to a simple economy. We just have two states, boom and bust. We have two assets and we're gonna make a portfolio that is half in asset A and half in asset B. So here, the problem is already giving us our portfolio weights. There's a 40% chance of the boom and a 60% chance of the bust. Here are our actual returns for each asset. A does well in the boom and loses money in the bust. B loses money in the boom and does well in the bust, which you might think is kind of unusual, but this is called a contrarian asset. And a contrarian asset is exactly one that has returns like this, that are contrary to the average or normal options in the market. Right? So this is an asset that does well when things are doing poorly and one that typically does poorly when things are doing well. And sort of the prototypical example of a contrarian asset normally is gold. Gold tends to be a safety asset. So when the stock market and all the other financial assets are doing really well, people are selling their gold and they're buying other things. So the expected return for gold is low because the price of gold is falling in good times. On the other hand, when things are bad and people are running to safety, they're buying gold and burying it in their backyards, then the price of gold is rising quickly and the expected return is positive as everything else is falling. Now there are other contrarian assets that we can investigate, but this is part of what I mean by forming an intelligent portfolio. We'd like to think about the way that different assets interact with each other. And we'd like to be able to form a portfolio where when one asset is doing poorly, the other is doing well and vice versa. Okay. So let's look at the portfolio we want. Ultimately, we want the expected return and standard deviation for the portfolio, but let's start with the expected return and standard deviation for each asset. Okay. So the expected return for asset A is the probability weighted actual return. There is a 40% probability of a boom. And in the boom, asset A has a 30% return. Plus a 60% probability of a bust. And in the bust, asset A loses 10%. Do my algebra and calculate an expected return for asset A of 6%. For asset B, the expected return is the 40% probability of a boom, and in the boom, asset B loses 5%. But in the bust, which has a 60% probability of occurring, asset B makes 25%, which is a 13% expected return. Okay, so our contrarian asset has a slightly higher, not slightly, almost double, uh, or more than double expected return of our, of our standard asset. But we know that we need to look at the risk before we understand these two assets in com uh, completely. So we wanna look at the variance and the standard deviation. The variance is the probability of each state times the difference between the actual return in the, of that asset in that state and the expected return squared and so there's a 60% probability of the bust. Asset Oh, sorry, I'm doing B here. Yeah, let me just do B. Okay. So I, I got my numbers mixed up. Oh, I got my numbers all the way mixed up. All right, let me just uh, cross that out. 40% probability of the boom in the boom, the actual return is 30%, expected return of 6% squared, plus a 60% probability of a bust. And in the bust, asset A loses 10%, minus its expected return of 6% squared. So that gives us a variance, right? Sigma squared, 
for asset A of 0 0.0384. And then the square root of the variance is standard deviation or just sigma. So I take the square root and I get 19.59%. Now we can do it for asset B. The variance of the return on B is the probability of each state, so probability of the boom, times the return in the boom, asset B loses 5% in the boom, minus its expected return, 13% squared. 60% chance of the bust, and in the bust, asset B makes 25%, minus its expected return of 13% squared. That gives me a variance of 0 0.0216. Square root of that is 0.1469 or 14.69%. Now notice that my example here is a little off, breaks the fundamental rule of finance, which is that risk and return trade off. And it does so because notice that asset B has a higher expected return than asset A and a lower risk. So by definition here, B is fundamentally a more attractive and better asset than asset A. And of course, this breaks the rule. And again, that's just because I make these numbers up off the top of my head. Uh, so I don't always get it right. Um, but this is what we're looking for if we are comparing assets, right? We're looking for an asset with the highest return and the lowest risk or the best combination of those for our personal risk preferences. Okay. Now, we uh, need to calculate the expected return and risk of the portfolio, which is the combination of these two assets. And we are combining these two assets in a 50-50 portfolio. So half of my money is going to be in A, half is going to be in B. And this is only going to be beneficial for us if it helps us reduce our overall risk, which is still quite high for both of these assets. Okay? So to do that from this scenario, we have to, uh, we have to create uh, a third column up here, which is that I need the actual returns in each state of the portfolio that has half of my money in asset A and half of my money in asset B. So what actually happens to my portfolio, okay? And the way that I do that is I calculate what the actual return would be for the portfolio in each state. And that looks like this, right? In the boom state. In the boom state, I have half of my money invested in A. So the weight of the portfolio invested in A is 50%. And that proportion of my portfolio will earn the actual return on asset A which is 30%, plus I have half of my money invested in B, so that's the weight of the portfolio in B, times the actual return for asset B, in other words, the 50% of my money that is invested in B will actually return minus 5%. for an actual return of 12 and a half. Right? So a portfolio that is 50% A and 50% B, well, half of my money will make 30, half of my money will lose five. The average there, the, the weighted average of that is 12 and a half. And we do the same thing for each state. So for my bust, half of my money is invested in asset A and that is gonna lose 10% and half of my money is in B, which will luckily make 25%, and my actual return 
in the portfolio, well, some of it will make money, some of it will lose money, but the portfolio will be up 75%, 7.5% rather. Right. So my ex now I can use the second method to calculate my expected return right, for a portfolio, which is to treat my portfolio just like any other asset. Right. So my two methods, I can do the expected return of the portfolio as the weighted average of the expected return of the assets, which is what we saw in the last problem. Or I can just treat the expected return of the portfolio the same as I do any other portfolio, any other asset, which is to say it's the probability weighted average of the actual return of the asset. And that's why I've calculated the actual returns here. So the probability of each state, 40%, times the actual return for my portfolio in the boom state, 12 and a half, plus a 60% chance of a bust times the actual return for the portfolio in the bust, which is seven and a half, gives me an expected return of 9.5. Now, Notice that this is slightly better than my expected return for A and slightly worse than my expected return for B, which is sort of by definition because my portfolio is half A and half B. And so if I took half of six, which is three, and half of 13, which is 6.5, I'd get my expected return for the portfolio, which is 9.5, right? So this is what we expect. I'd make more money, more higher expected return by only investing in B, but this will make me better off if the combination of what I've done reduces my risk. Right? So let's look at the important part, which is the variance of the portfolio. And the variance of the portfolio is the probability of each state times the difference between the actual return of the portfolio in the boom state minus its expected return squared. plus the probability of the bust state times the difference between the actual return of the portfolio in the bust state minus the expected return of the portfolio squared. And that gives me a variance of 0 0.0006. Square root of that is the standard deviation and the standard deviation is 2.5%. And now you can see the power of forming a portfolio, intelligently forming a portfolio. If I can choose the right collection of assets whose good and bad states are opposing each other, I can form a portfolio where I reduce my maximum expected return slightly, but I reduce my maximum risk enormously, right? Yes, I am going to make 3.5% less here than I would if all my money was in asset B. But if all my money was in asset B, I would face a risk of 14.69%, right? And remember what risk means. It means that my potential outcomes would be in a range that are around my expected return. So there's 13 plus one standard deviation minus one standard deviation. Well, 13 plus almost 15. So I could make as much as say 27% and I could lose as much as say 1%. So I take significant risk. Remember 68% of my future outcomes are gonna be between these two ranges. So I have a risk here of losing quite a bit of money. With my portfolio, I have done significantly better, right? Now my expected return is 9.5, but my standard deviation is only two and a half, right? So that gives me 12 and seven, right? So my curve is made skinnier and taller, right? 68% of my outcomes are now gonna be between seven and 12. And so I have drastically reduced my risk and for, for that, the potential future outcomes that might happen to me. Right? 
And this is a really powerful thing, right? In fact, it's even more powerful than what I'm showing here. What I'm showing here is just a uh, naive uh, portfolio weighting, which is just 50-50. We could take these exact same assets and we could make this uh, slightly more uh, appealing uh, in the following way. So instead of doing a naive portfolio weighting, let's do a intelligent portfolio weighting. We recognize that these two assets have the ability to reduce our risk in a significant way. But how much can they reduce our risk? Well, if we do a better weighting job, we can see, right? So instead of putting half of my money in A and half in B, let's put three sevenths in A and four sevenths in B, right? And then let's calculate the actual portfolio returns. So in the boom, the weight of A times the return of A plus the weight of B times the return of B. So the weight of A, well, three sevenths of my money will be in asset A and that portion of my portfolio will make 30% in the boom. And there will be four sevenths of my money in B and that proportion will lose 5% in the boom for an expected return, or sorry, for an actual return of 10%. Right? In the bust, the expected return, or the actual return, three-sevenths of my money is in A, and in A, my actual return is losing 10% in the bust. Four-sevenths of my money is in B, and that portion of my portfolio will make 25% for an actual return of 10%. And now, can you see what we've done? Right? I hope so. For one, the expected return is the probability weighted average return of the actual returns. Right? Well, there isn't any difference. The expected return is the probability of each state, 40% chance of the boom, 10% actual return in the boom, plus the bust, 60% chance of the bust, 10% actual return in the bust for an expected return of 10%. I make 10% no matter what state I'm in. So my expected return is exactly 10%. And the variance of the portfolio is the probability of the boom, 40%, times the difference between the actual return and the expected return squared, plus the probability of the bust times the difference between the actual return and the bust and the expected return squared, which is zero. Because notice what we've done. We've created a portfolio whose actual returns are the same in both states of the world. And that means there isn't any variation between expected and actual returns. This is a completely risk-free return. I will get 10% no matter what happens about the future. Now, is this a realistic example, right? Not quite. There's a few things that we can't possibly know about the future. One is, I can't possibly know the probability of each state. And I can't, even before that, can't possibly know what states are, are likely or even possible, right? Remember, in the real world, there's an infinite number of futures and I don't know what the probability of any of those futures are occurring, right? Certainly nobody would have guessed uh, that the market was gonna tank in February of this year, right? So we just can't know. And even if I could know all of that, I can't know what the actual returns in each state were gonna be. If I could, I could make the perfect portfolio. Because I can't, I just have to look at historical numbers and try to make the best guess about what I think is gonna happen. And that may not always be perfect, but it's certainly better than nothing.